Welcome to the review of Ultima 6. Ultima 6 is a role-playing game which was created by Origin in 1990. The premise of the story is that the Avatar is captured by gargoyles in the land of Britannia and the gargoyles have taken over shrines of virtue and it's up to the Avatar to be freed and to save the world from the gargoyles. As the story goes along, the perspective changes, however, based on the gargoyle's story. The main menu of the game allows you to see an introduction, create a character, transfer a character, see acknowledgments, or journey onward. It's interesting that you can see acknowledgments at the beginning of the game. Usually in most games will show this as kind of an honor at the end of the game once you've won. But I guess they're proud of this game and would rather show the credits up front. And I don't blame them, this is one heck of a game. If you have a character from a previous Ultima, you can transfer it from the transfer character game. But we're going to go ahead and create a new one. You can choose male or female. And change the sex up front. Or you can change your portrait. You are kind of limited with what you can choose for the portraits. All of them are very distinct looking. Now this is role playing in the strongest sense. It talks about you. It keeps using the word you as you go in here to drink these potions from this gypsy. Based on the words you choose, it will determine your attributes when you're created as an avatar. The keywords are valor, sacrifice, humility, spirituality, and basically it's the words that represent the shrines in the game. Once you've made your choices, the game begins. And you start off in the middle of a battle with gargoyles in Lord British's castle. Lord British is a good guy, and gargoyles at this point in time are the bad guys. You also have three other party members with you, Dupre, Shimino, and Yolo. After killing the gargoyles, the castle's safe again and you're allowed to start roaming around and talking to people. The first one obviously you'll talk to is Lord British. He basically asks you a few questions that are copyright type questions make sure you have a manual that the game required now of course with the internet that's pretty much useless once you answer his questions he gives you a key so you can exit the castle Ultima 6 is heavily based on community and characters it is probably the best role-playing game I've ever played for having such a diverse number of characters and people you can talk to really makes it feel like its own little world. There's even a little mouse you can talk to. Once you start the game, you'll start wandering around the castle, picking up items and trying to open doors. Sometimes you'll run into locked ones. If it's an oaken wooden door, you can bash it down. If there's steel doors that are locked, you can try to pick them if you have lock picks. But that doesn't always work. Sometimes they break. Sometimes you have to use a special key to get certain doors open. And sometimes you'll run into magically locked doors. And the only way to get those open is if you have a spell called Unlock Magic, which you do not start with. The game has the ability to use the mouse or to use a keyboard so you can look around and perform actions based on either one. You can pick up objects. Pretty much any object in the game can be picked up unless it's something too heavy or a backdrop type item. You can also move objects around. So the world's very dynamic and interactive. Some items are consumable where you use them in your inventory and they disappear. Others are equipable. If you look at some objects, they'll give you information, such as how much it weighs, and this armor can absorb two points of damage. 
You can equip items by putting them in your inventory and then clicking on them. The left side of the screen shows your basically the positions where things can be equipped, such as your hands, your head, your feet, your legs. So you only have so many slots to equip certain items. You're also limited based on your strength, which is an attribute of the character. Stumbling around the castle, you'll run into a spell book, which you can take for free. It has a few base spells in it, up to second level spells. Incidentally, there's up to eight levels of spells in the game. You'll also find some potions scattered about. Every potion is good except for green and orange. Green poisons and orange makes you fall asleep. One awesome feature about the game is if you look inside crates or treasure chests, items will dump out in quantity and it'll tell you what's inside them. Sometimes you'll find trap treasure chests such as the one I just opened that exploded. But sometimes they'll be perfectly safe. You can keep picking up items until you run into your character's encumbrance limitation. But then you can switch to solo mode, which allows you to switch to a different character and have them act as the main character and pick up items. So basically the way it works is there's a focus. And you're either in solo mode or party mode. If you're in party mode, uh, the main character, which of course is the avatar, walks around and everybody follows him. If you're in solo mode, only the character that has focus will act. All the others will remain as they are. There's also some handy icons that allows you to shuffle through the character's inventory. As I said, the world's interactive. You can break mirrors and look at clocks, which tell you what time it is. You can douse fireplaces or light them. This clock tells us it's 8.52 a.m. Incidentally, sundials also will tell you the time. And if you run across a book, you can look at it and it'll read the contents. Very cool. Same thing with letters and scrolls. You'll spend a good portion of the game in the beginning walk around taking items, especially food. Mmm, food. The game's also full of puzzles and mystery. Like you have to use this drawbridge mechanism to get it to lower and you have to go over to this other room and flip the switch to get the gate to open. Then you're going around in a scavenger hunt mode most of the game, picking up these runes. And the purpose of these runes is to free the shrines that have been taken over. Sometimes you'll find them under plants. Sometimes you'll find them by talking to people. As I mentioned with the scavenger hunt, you'll also be trying to find pieces of map. There's a part of the game where you're trying to find a pirate map and put the pieces together. Or you'll be running around buying items such as this U log, which you'll use for something else later. And the game is usually a hard way and easy way of doing things. The easy way would be to steal this fan instead of actually finding the items to make it. You can play musical instruments. Here's a harpsichord. And if we run across to the other side of these people, there's a harp. The music helps give the game a charming little atmosphere. Like when you're in a tavern, musicians playing in the background. Now when the game was installed, you were given a choice of not only the graphic display and if you have a mouse, but the type of musical mode to use. And if we use the ad lib, the MIDI sound is much better, which you'll hear in a second. I started the game in PC mode though to save your ears so that you didn't have to listen to the loud and somewhat annoying music at times. Although the music is good. Okay, back to the game. 
Uh, there's areas where you're going to be exploring different towns and you'll run across many shops in your travels and you can be unvirtuous and steal items and the storekeepers will get mad and yell stop thief and if they see you do this they will attack you and they'll call, call for guards and of course you can fight back and slaughter them not very virtuous And then you can look at their dead body. And I'll tell you it weighs 16 stones. Now see, if you steal outside the vision of the storekeeper, it just says stealing. But if you're in vision, stop thief. And speaking of vision, it's cool because you can walk by windows and it'll show the inside of a building. Even if the door is closed. Now you can find many different shops. They'll sell all kinds of different items. Typically you're looking for weapons and armor. And... They will actually buy equipment from you, but only the type they sell, which is really cool. It makes you running around trying to sell off all this extra stuff you find, but you have to find the right shop. There's bakeries where you can buy food. Incidentally, some items stack in your inventory, and in that case, they'll ask you for how many you want to buy. For instance, here we're going to buy a bag in order to put items in. They're three gold each, but I just want one, sir. There's also a concept of what's called reagents, which are used to cast magical spells, and you'll find some storekeepers willing to get rid of those. And you can find reagents scattered throughout the land at times, too, although they're very rare. Here's a mage in a town called Cove who's willing to sell you some spells. The way it works is you tell him what circle, which is basically the level of spell, and he tells you what types of spells he has. What happens is it gives you a page that you can then put inside your spell book. And now to combat. Here we're fighting a few gargoyles. You see these items shooting across the screen? Some of those are missiles from a crossbow or a bow and arrow and some of them are spells. You might see a lightning bolt here or there. Well the way you attack is you can either be in combat mode or party mode. If you're in combat mode the NPCs in your party will attack based on the attack mode you have set for them. If you're in party mode they're just gonna stand there while only your main party member attacks. There we just lost Shimino, and you'll notice he, his icon disappeared from our list of characters, and his dead body's there. It has the concept of rounds, it's turn-based, so if I drink this potion to heal myself, that just took my turn. And each step takes a turn, as well as an attack. And there goes Dupre. And there goes me. It's charming music's played when you die. The game designers chose to only award the killer of the final blow the experience. So sometimes you'll want to go into solo mode with a certain character if you want only them to get the experience. Here we're fighting some headless, cyclops, and trolls. Sound effects aren't the best. But, at least they're short. Now here's the attack modes I was talking about. Front, rear, flank, berserk. Then there's retreat and assault. And of course you can even manually control them. And after you kill enemies, there's dead bodies left behind that you can search. Find equipment. Sometimes you'll find a treasure chest, and the treasure chest may be armed with a trap. Now we got poison gas spewed at us. Speaking of poison, there's different ways to get poison in the game. You can walk through a swamp, you may run into a poison field, or get poisoned by a monster. Your hit points appear green when you get poisoned, and you can cure yourself with a red potion or even the dispel magic spell. 
Speaking of potions, there's purple potions, which cast a spell of protection on you. And the protection increases your ability to absorb damage and to walk over traps without being injured. There's also a white potion, which allows you to have x-ray vision for a split second. Here we can see the inside of the bakery. Then there's a black potion, which turns you invisible. Your character's outline is shown with this teal color. The cool thing about being invisible in Ultima 6 is you can attack and do other things, and you will not lose your invisibility. So here the drakes get massacred without knowing what's happening. Now let's talk a little bit about spells and various things you can do in combat. When you cast a spell, the graphic shows the missile fire toward the target. Some are area effect and some are single targets. Spells can also get blocked by the walls and other objects. When you shoot missile type weapons, it shows a projectile go toward the enemy. Boomerangs can be shot in return, whereas arrows and axes and spears get thrown and uh, the latter land on the ground. You can pick them up and collect them, which has a ton of them that show up in your inventory. But as you throw them, the nice thing is they auto-equip. Special weapons like oil flasks leave fire fields behind, which can damage the enemy as they stand on them. Then there's weapons like slings, which don't require projectiles. And then there's special weapons like wands, fire wands and lightning wands. There's even special weapons like a triple crossbow that shoots three bolts at a time. Then you have your standard melee weapons, like one-handed swords and maces. And the infamous rolling pin does two whole points of damage. As mentioned earlier, there's one-handed and two-handed weapons. The two-handed generally do more damage. When using melee weapons, you have to be right next to the enemy to attack. Except for the Halberd Morning Star, you can be two positions away. The ultimate weapon is called a glass sword, which does 255 damage but breaks once it's used. And then there's miscellaneous armor slash weapons like a spiked helmet, spiked shield. They allow you to attack but also absorb some damage. And there's miscellaneous armor items. Magic equipment is the best. And you also can find rings, such as the Ring of Regeneration, which heals hit points every round that passes. You'll notice Daryl's health is going up. The game even sports a cannon, which can do up to 90 damage. You can't pick it up, but you can use it and move them around. You can rest during the game, and this requires you to be in the wilderness. It asks how many hours and who will stand guard. If Yolo's in your party and you have sound enabled, he'll play a nice little tune for you as you go to sleep. Everybody in the party eats food. This helps heal them. And you'll notice the night turns to day. Can't rest in the wilderness nor can you rest when there's foes near. If you're resting and enemies are around and you have someone on guard, the guard will wake up the rest of the party. The safest place to rest, of course, is going to an inn. You have to pay a little fee, but it's worth it because you get healed almost completely and you don't have to worry about enemies attacking you. You can also be healed by casting spells or drinking yellow potions. Or you can visit a healer. This healer seems to be having hearing problems. You keep saying heal, 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 and she doesn't hear you, and then all of a sudden she finally does. Kind of entertaining. Healers can also cure you of poison and resurrect you. One of our party members is carrying the dead body of another one named Blaine. 
the priest sees this and asks if we want to pay to be resurrected and we simply say yes and then Blaine is back with us resurrected characters only have one hit point but at least they're alive one of my favorite features about Ultima 6 is how the characters actually have lifestyles like here this innkeeper decided it was time to go to sleep incidentally when somebody's sleeping you can steal right from under their nose but that wouldn't be very virtuous there's a lot of hidden passages in secret rooms in Ultima 6 here we go downstairs and we're in the middle of a dungeon Which incidentally you can use a torch in one hand to light up the area or you can cast a light spell in addition to hidden passages there's hidden traps There's also a lot of mini quests in the game. Here we're trying to get this old pirate to retire and give us her belt so we can join this guild. But she says no, she won't do it. So we try to attack her. And we die. Not a good idea to fight a woman with glass swords. Incidentally, there's a save game feature and a restore game feature. We'll be using that quite a bit. Outsmarter with wits, huh? Well, let's use our good old poison spell. Okay, she's poisoned. So now we just sit around and until it gets the best of her. She's sleeping. Oh, it woke her up. She must have a bad belly ache. Come on, woman, die already. Oh, there she goes, and her dead body's just laying there for us to search. Glass sword, glass sword, glass sword. All right, we're in business. And magic equipment, and of course our guild belt. There's lots of funny things you could do to get around things, like push this trap onto this other trap, and only the top one activates so you don't get poisoned. You only take damage from this bear trap. You'll run across some individuals that'll want to join your party. You simply ask them to join and then they're off with you. Different NPCs have different attributes and start at different levels. Here Jaina starts at level 4. And this particular fighter is level 3, while this one is a tough guy at level 5. Kind of looks like Charles Bronson. Yeah, I'd like Charles Bronson on my team. Some of your party members, like Yolo, have special roles. Like he can pool all the gold for you if you type pool when you talk to him. And you can ask NPCs to leave, and they'll leave their supplies behind. For instance, you find Hot Leonora, and you want to dump Janna, go ahead and do it. Finally, there's the shrines I was talking about earlier. There you have to free them, using the right rune and mantra. Once you have enough experience points to advance to a next level, the character simply talks to an altar at one of the shrines and speaks the mantra. Each altar will change which attributes get to increase. The Shrine of Compassion increases dexterity by 3 points. They all give you 30 extra hit points every time you increase a level. You'll notice level 4 with 627 experience total and my max hit points went up to 120. Shrines typically have moon gates by them too, which teleport you to a different area. The teleportation depends on where the moons are at in the game. You can also bury a moonstone you found, and in its place will appear a moon gate. Here we just teleported to the Shrine of Spirituality. The problem is once you go through a moon gate, you try to go back through it again, you'll appear in the same place until the moon has changed. And unfortunately, in this particular shrine, you're stuck because the borders are surrounded by what's called a void. Basically, you're in the middle of nowhere. So you have to wait your way out 
or cast some type of spell to teleport back out of here such as the help spell which is a level one spell that returns you right back to Lord British yeah it's kind of a cheat spell in my opinion you'll do lots of exploring in the game and dungeons or on the overland you'll find various signs pointing in directions there's mountains grass swampland there's caves you can find and adventure into such as the Cyclops cave and you may run across a raft here and there the rafts are interesting you get on them and they'll let you float on water but you can't control them you'll find these little skiffs throughout the land which you can control and at some point in your adventure you may decide to actually buy a ship here we just bought one for 300 gold pieces and Artie seems pleased. Well, I should say so. 300 gold. You get a nice little ship deed in your inventory. It gives you permission to take the ship. The advantage to a ship is that it actually has cannons on board. So you can attack things as you're traveling. Such as innocent kids you can shoot on the sideline. Or their moms. Oops, sorry about that. Guess let's be going. No, seriously, you use them to attack sea serpents and other creatures that are nasty at sea. The other mode of transportation is by horse. Here we're going to actually ride a wild horse. Oh, tamed him pretty quickly. There's a lot of funny things in the game, like this guillotine with a basket right at the bottom. That's pretty charming. Or you might run across a person in stocks. Or a villager who runs the local jail who you simply ask him for the keys and he gives them to you. So then you can free the prisoner so you can kill him. Oh, he just summoned a troll on us, huh? Oh, now the guards are pissed. So they ask us to surrender and we say no. So we're going to attack the guards. Ah, that mage is still summoning stuff. Ugh, giant spider. Keep away from that. Man, that mage is really pissed. He just charmed one of the guards. Now he's summoning what? Oh, a snake! And then he kills the snake! Okay, I think this mage really is insane. And somewhat annoying feature is that when enemies are critically hurt, they'll run from you. And you chase them down to a corner and then slam them in cold blood. Here's the help spell, i.e. the cheat spell I talked about earlier. It completely heals you and sends you back to Lord British and you're resurrected too. You can use gems as special items which reveals a map. It's pretty cool. You can do things like search graves and steal the dead bodies. You can be a true grave digger. Meat? Why is there meat in a grave? Uh, never mind. Stop thief! Quit stealing the dead bodies! Fine, I'll drop them. The guard comes after us. Will you come quietly? Sure, why not? So he knocks us unconscious and we wake up in our famous jail. And... Oh, our key's gone. So let's drop one of our powder kegs and blow the door off the hinges. Alright, so now that the door's gone... Let's go attack some of these prisoners again, such as his mage. And the guard says, will you come quietly? Sure. Knocks us unconscious. I guess we'll appear... Wait a minute, it's the same jail cell, and the door's gone. So we just walk right out and the guard doesn't care. Quirkiness. The game's got lots of quirkiness. There's spells like create food and my, one of my favorites, pickpocket. 
It allows you to grab any inventory on any of the enemies. Wow, this Drake's carrying a lot of gold. He can even pickpocket not only villagers, but people that are sleeping. One of the cool things about pickpocket is it shows you how strong the person is. That guy's got 27 strength. You can even pickpocket Lord British. Take his cool rings. Damn, Lord British is strong. He's got 30 strength. He should be out there fighting these gargoyles. Another cool spell is one called Seance, which you can cast on a dead body and allows you to talk to the person as if they're alive. Ah, but the game designers put in a caveat. If you attack somebody and kill them on purpose, Seance won't work. But let's say they were accidentally killed by a powder keg that I happened to light. Then all of a sudden, you can talk to them. Can you heal me? Come to my shop when I'm open. Sorry, buddy. You're dead. Did I mention this game has a lot of quirkiness? But still, this spell is completely cool. There's not many games that would have something like this. So, this about wraps up our review of Ultima 6. It's definitely one of my top role-playing games. I'd say... If not the best, maybe the second best. The way the world is so diverse and community-oriented with people and how you can interact with basically any type of object on the screen is just amazing, way ahead of its time. Just remember, this game was made in 1990. It has different modes of transportation. It has pretty good music for the time. The graphics are pretty good. You can have up to eight characters, you can have momentous battles, there's fun spells like pickpocket and seance and poison. It's just all around fun game. I don't really have any complaints whatsoever. Well, maybe the main menu with its ugly colors. But besides that, this game is about as perfect as you can get. I'll leave you with the theme song. Thanks for watching and see you next time.